Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Bannerton, a partner with Total Bank Solutions, joined by my colleague, Brian Tully. And what we're really excited about is the opportunity to present to you today a, uh, a use case that we think is very timely and very compelling. And before I get into more of the detail, I'm going to turn some of that over to Brian. But I just do want to take a few minutes to introduce you to our firm, tell you a little bit about Total Bank Solutions, talk to you a little bit about the opportunity, why it's so timely, why it's important. And then Brian's going to walk you through kind of what the current state is. For some of you who may not be familiar with what happens in the U.S. around FDIC insurance, we'll talk a little bit about the current process and why there's some inefficiencies and how we're transitioning to a, a way of essentially reinventing how that process works by integrating the Corda Enterprise platform. So I'm teasing a little bit of the, uh, uh, the end state there. But just a little bit about Total Bank Solutions. Our mission at Total Bank Solutions is to help our clients achieve success by leveraging our solutions to help meet their cash sweep, deposit funding, securities-based lending, which here in the UK are often referred to as Lombard lending, and risk management needs today and the future. Uh, we highlighted success because, as you've probably found, is success can be defined in many different ways. And if you ask two people, you get three different answers. So uh, often we like to think about how do we spend time with our clients to kind of mutually define what success means in any of these endeavors? And then obviously with an eye toward aligning our interests so that we can grow together and emerge um, and evolve our businesses together. A little bit about our company. We were founded in 2004. We're a privately held financial technology company today. And we're up to 72 employees. So obviously a lot smaller than many firms here, uh, but also growing. Uh, we've probably added about 30 full-time employees over the course of the last 18 months, so we've been growing quite a bit. Um, for our deposit programs, we process on about $40 billion of assets under administration. That's the way we kind of count the, uh, uh, the processing capabilities. And our revenues have been growing on average about 35% over the last five years. We are very much committed to this idea and concept of financial services as a service and what that means as we migrate toward that uh, type of business model. So partnering with Corda or R3 and the Corda platform really is a way of enabling what we see as a little bit more of the future of how products and services will be delivered. Uh, today we're currently working with a little over 200 banks uh, in the U.S., but these are your large multinational top five size banks all the way down to regional and community banks. So we have a wide range of clients uh, from the bank side. And then as we define financial intermediaries, that really is everything from broker dealers, clearing firms, trust companies, so anybody who has a source of cash uh, defined as financial intermediaries. So those are the two sides of our platform, essentially. And when we look at the business, we're really focused in two main areas. I know the term fintech is very generally uh, referred to, so we try to break it down in terms of the segments of wealth management and risk and analytics. On the wealth management side of our business, this is where our deposit suite programs uh, live. And what we're doing here is we're essentially creating an opportunity where the insured deposit program provides extended FDIC insurance. In the US, the limit per bank is 250,000. So by matching an in intermediary with a network of banks, we can provide upwards of two and a half, five million, depending on the number of banks that participate. So that's essentially what the platform does. Uh, the product we're going to talk about today, the reciprocal deposits, is essentially an extension of those capabilities. I mentioned the uh, securities-based lending platform. That, again, is matching intermediaries, many who do not have an affiliated bank, who would like to uh, basically originate a loan against those securities, securities portfolios, so we can match through our underwriting and origination modules the ability to underwrite those loans. And then on the risk side, we do have a uh, risk-based analytic tool that does um, safety and soundness analysis on banks. So that's a subscription basis, but we also do have market data services uh, related to that. So when we think about the firm, we're also always thinking about how are we adding value. I think that's one of the themes I've heard throughout is that, okay, we can talk about new technology, how great it is, but what is the business proposition? What is the value that we're bringing? So the way we like to think about it is that you know, we're fortunate to have a team of individuals with a lot of industry experience. So that gives us some pretty good insight on specific problems that we're trying to solve for. And often that leads to a better business process. And it could be either delivered through a advanced technology, which helps deliver that more efficiently. But sometimes advanced technology comes along and provides you with a new opportunity or a new business process. So it can come 
from a few different angles, but we think the combination of those things is really what brings uh, added value. And obviously, we want to do all this through a secure and flexible platform. So I've used the term innovation, but sometimes it helps to have a working definition before we move forward. So when I think about our opportunity with the reciprocal deposits that Brian's going to talk about, we do see it as innovative, but there's a, a certain way of thinking about it. Um, there's a good definition by uh, Victor Fernandez here that says, uh, innovation is either creating new value and or capturing value in a new way. So you can kind of look at it from two different perspectives. So we're thinking about it in terms of capturing value in a new way. And sometimes you actually need a catalyst, some trigger point, to actually instill in people the reason to look. Because otherwise, it's easy to just do the status quo. Something isn't broken. I don't have a reason to change. But when you have a few things line up, like regulatory changes, a better business process, new technology, these things can come into, come into focus. So what we had in the US was earlier in the year a significant uh, passage of a new law, Rule S2155, which is a great branding name for a, a rule, <laughs> but essentially had significant change in the landscape uh, across financial services. But there was one area within there that applied to banks that changed the treatment of reciprocal deposits from previously brokered to non-brokered. So for those who are not in the US, that essentially means for larger banks it has a a worse treatment in terms of LCR runoff. So it's, it's significant in terms of the change, um, but it also uh, created a bigger opportunity in the market to take advantage of that. That coupled with this idea of a distributor or decentralized business model, and when I talk about the availability of new technology, you add quarter to the mix, and now you have something. You have timeliness and an opportunity. And that's the way we've been seeing this, this play out, is that we think the timing is right, the opportunity is there, and the technology is here. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian to take you through the next step. Thank you. So my experience and background for the past 17 years, I've been working in the reciprocal marketplace, OK? Um, it, it is a, it's a very large, robust market, pro approximately about $50 billion. Uh, in reciprocal deposits today that are circulating in the banking system, the U.S. banking system. And so I, it helps to have a, a groundwork understanding of what a reciprocal deposit is and does. It really um, <clears throat> it helps banks achieve two main objectives. So clients that are looking for greater deposit insurance uh, for that client who has a $5 million or $10 million deposit they have to go to a lot of banks and break up that deposit into a lot of pieces and track all of that. What we are doing at TBS is we're doing all of that legwork for the clients on behalf of the banks. And at the same time, for banks that are looking for deposits, you know, the deposit landscape in the U.S., it changes. It's very cyclical. Banks want deposits. Banks don't want deposits. So for the larger banks, they have access to the capital markets as compared to the smaller banks. The smaller banks you know, tend to rely on this type of, of funding. But now the larger banks, because really this type of funding is now essentially cheaper due to the passage of S2155, um, it has changed the way the treatment of these deposits from brokered um, to being classified as non-brokered. So these deposits, these large deposits, will become much more efficient, um, much more cost effective for even the larger banks to participate in. Today, you know, I've heard uh, the, the term monopoly or I've heard the term, you know, there's only, uh, we need to disrupt the market. Today, there's only one provider of reciprocal deposits. And that, um, you know, that, that is something that we are here to disrupt. We are taking a centralized model for reciprocal deposits, and we're basically modernizing it. Um, this, this requires us to build uh, a very strong network of cohesive banks that are all working on blockchain projects with, um, with Corda. And in the center of that network of banks today is a custodian. And that custodian um, is also acting as the record keeper for the entire network of banks. 
Um, we believe that this model can be turned upside down because that custodian is taking about two-thirds of the revenue uh, in the entire equation. So we'll be able to cut costs dramatically for any participating bank. And um, you know, it, it's essentially uh, turning this model that you see here, where you have the custodian doing the record keeping for all of the banks and transitioning it to something that looks like this. So from this picture, you can see the little blue circle in the corner. This is something that's very exciting to us and to uh, especially the, the large banks. This is the FDIC. So in, in the previous model, there's no FDIC here, right? If a bank fails, this custodian in this model that has $50 billion in it needs to report this information to the FDIC in a very timely manner when a bank fails. I lived through you know, a couple of bank failure cycles, and it's, um, it's chaotic, to say the least. So in our model, um, we are basically having Corda in the middle, and Corda is going to be acting um, on our behalf to place the record keeping down onto the blockchain so that the FDIC, the little blue circle, will be able to see all the deposits that all of the banks have placed on behalf of their clients. They'll be able to see right through the network at any point in time. Uh, it'll change the whole timing of how banks fail. Typically, the FDIC would do all the failures on a Friday. You'd get a list of you know eight banks that have failed, and you're scrambling to figure out who has deposits with those banks and how are they are the customers insured principal and accrued interest there's a lot of work that goes into that but this record keeping now being done on the chain okay all the customers information is protected and again back to this model today banks have to transfer customer information to the custodian right with our model it can remain in the walls of the bank, which is a big security uh, bonus. So what we're looking at is, in this next slide, the old rails, okay, fed wire system, old communications, custodian, okay, and comparing it to the new rails. So if you look at the new rails, the quarter express, <laughs> you're, you're now dealing with uh, moving to a decentralized model, we're cutting costs by approximately two-thirds by removing that custodial piece there. There's no transfer of PII, customer data. And in the old model, the reporting that was generated by the custodian, there's a lot of issues around does it fit the member banks and, every, and all of those things. Now we have some standardization with reporting. Um, the, you know, really, we're starting out with a one-month product because we have to start somewhere with a term product. It's very easy and attractive to banks, and it's still short-term enough that investors will be interested. And it's really, you know, the one-month treasury, which is the same risk profile, um, has a lot of, it has the majority of the transaction. So short-term is better. Um, but we will have unlimited permutations as far as maturities go. And talking about regulatory access, again, the FDIC is going to have its own node on the platform. So it can see at any point in time through to all the transactions, not only the dollar amounts, but it can see rates and it can trend those with movements in the economy as well. Um, there is also we'll be pulling a lot of risk out of the system by by moving to this this platform. Um, we'll be eliminating you know the timing risk when a bank fails, uh, because typically banks fail on a Friday. They are sold by Monday or Tuesday. Um, the, the FDIC will have all of this information even before they let the bank fail. And <clears throat> manual reconciliation, but another 
very important piece here is by 2020, there is a mandate for the largest banks, the 32 largest banks in the United States, they're called GSIBs, uh, they will have a mandate to show for pass-through record keeping to the FDIC. And what we are building, what, we, I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna show you here is pass-through record keeping, okay, on the blockchain. So big banks will be able to solve for that requirement by 2020 simply by using our reciprocal solution. So it's very elegant. Now, the opportunity, the way we see the opportunity. Today, approximately 45 billion, between 45 and 50 billion, it fluctuates a little bit. <clears throat> the reciprocal balances in the marketplace, 94% of those balances are held by banks that are less than 25 billion. So the smaller banks are the primary users of the reciprocal product. Reciprocal balances today, okay, 1% approximately are in banks that are greater than 50 billion. So if you project that out, the 45 billion, and <clears throat> because of the 5 billion or 20% of liabilities that the FDIC is allowing the large banks to categorize as non-brokered, which is in essence core, if you project that out to the largest banks that aren't participating, it looks to be about 415 billion. So to go from 45 billion to 415, that's a significant opportunity. And those numbers come from the five billion, okay, cap um, or 20% of liability. So most of the smaller banks they meet, they, they hit that 20% of liabilities. They're not anywhere near the five billion mark. And over time, we see this, you know, moving to, uh, for banks that are greater than 50 billion to be approximately 30 billion. Now, what I'm gonna show you right here is the demo. Okay, this is the POC that we've been working on. So, <clears throat> the way that we have built it, this is, this is, um, the user interface and in this example what we did is we created a very small ecosystem of banks uh, we assumed five banks that were participating in this system and what you're looking at is the home page for Gotham National Bank and in the upper left corner you'll see got total bank solutions it's our user interface the banks logo the bank profile, so going down the left side, uh, the bank profile is information that is unique to that bank because when we run our matching for these deposits to get customers FDIC insurance at multiple banks, we're looking first at bank profiles, then we're looking at customer profiles. Um, and within that bank profile area, that, that is where a bank would set up their unique user identification okay, including their ABA or routing number. The customer profiles, the banks would either send us a file or um, simply enter customer information uh, that we can use that is unique to each customer. Okay, so it's, it's data that's unique to each customer so that in the case of a bank failure, the FDIC can then pull those records up uh, by tax ID. That's how we do our matching. What you're looking at here is the order processing screen. Now, in the order processing screen, we have, we've created silos of submitted orders and approved orders. We run an hourglass um, that tells our banks how much time until the next match. We are running our match once a week. Okay, so we're matching deposits with, between banks one day a week so that on Tuesday, by noon, all banks' orders have to be entered and submitted to our system. Tuesday at 12.01, we stop taking orders. We run our deposit matching. So I'll, I'll walk you through what that would look like. So on the submitted order screen, we've now, Gotham National Bank has four orders this week. And Bruce Wayne, Tom Hardy, Selena Kyle, Morgan Freeman, they each have a million dollars that they're placing that they want to get FDIC insurance coverage on. 
okay? So they're placing those orders. That means that the bank at this point has done all the due diligence, KYC, Patriot Act, OFAC compliance on each one of these clients. And they've verified that those clients have those funds in their account. Now, we move from the submitted order screen um, where you can actually select all and then you click on approve selected. They obviously move over into the approved orders section. So these orders are now in the system, live, ready to go until noon, 1201. That's when we start running the match. These can be deleted. A bank can go in and say, okay, Bruce Wayne has called and said, I want to pull mine out. I don't, want to, I don't want to place my order this week. As long as it hasn't been matched, it's there. Now at this point, based on I have eight minutes left, I'm going to show you what the match results look like. So you have these match results, the matched orders. I'm going to show you the court of view that we have built in here. So you have all of Bruce Wayne's orders. So you can see these are Gotham National Banks. These are orders that were placed. So Bruce Wayne's, his tax ID is blocked out. His order ID is in there, his CD ID. We assign a CD identifier to each CD that's been issued. Principal and accrued interest. There's zero accrued interest because we just ran the match. So the banks will be able to see, Gotham National Bank will be able to see all the information for their clients of CDs that were placed out in the network. Conversely, these are CDs that Gotham National Bank has issued to other banks customers. So every time a million goes out from Bruce Wayne, a million immediately comes back in that matching process. So that million dollar deposit principal never actually has to leave Gotham National Bank. If I owe you a dollar and you owe me a dollar, we don't give each other a dollar. We just need to keep track of what banks have issued CDs to what customers. So here is that information of what banks have issued CDs to what customers. Now, so Gotham National Bank, from a general ledger perspective, this is what they'll be booking into their GL. These are CDs that they've issued to other banks' clients. They don't have the tax ID or any customer information. All of that information is held within the walls of every participating bank, and it's not shared. Now, <clears throat> one of the other nice things that we have built into this is a regulator view that I'm going to show you. So the regulator view, if you, if you think about what's important to the regulator, they want to know what type of balances what maturities, what interest rates, a bank that's in trouble or is it close to failure, what their, what their balance sheet looks like, right? What their liabilities are. So here you have, i sort it by bank. Here you have a quick look, an FDIC look into what um, Gotham Bank, what Bank of Bravos, what all of the participating banks have on the liability side. So here's Goliath Bank. These are all the CDs that they have issued. Okay. And again, the customer information in the TIN right now, the FDIC doesn't need to know that information. Only when a bank fails and the FDIC has to assume control of that bank will that information then be available to the FDIC. A few of the questions that have come in uh, have been how big can this market actually get, which I think you, you, you covered a little bit, but how scalable is your solution? We believe this solution is very scalable. Um, we believe that the largest banks in the United States have not participated in a reciprocal program because of the negative connotation previously held to broker deposits. So, you know, the Large banks have broker deposits, but they don't want to fill that bucket. They already have ways to fill that bucket. So we believe that you know, the largest banks, the banks that are you know, over 25 billion, will see this as a great opportunity to improve LCR, uh, among, amongst other things. 
Fantastic. Uh, second question was, why did you choose once per week as the frequency for matching? Great question. Um, once per week, because if you think about it <clears throat> logically, no one can predict when a customer is going to walk in with a $1 million, $5 million, $10 million deposit. Or usually when those types of customers, they have that type of cash in their account, it's coming from somewhere else. It's coming from a maturing investment, right? So we had to start someplace to create some standardization. Over time, as the network grows and it becomes more scalable, we will add more days a week that we match and more maturities that we offer. Brilliant. And the final question was, uh, will banks be uh, become their own custodians and record keeping will be done using Corda? It's exactly how it works. So banks today, what they are for their clients is they are their own custodians. Um, and from a legal perspective, the way that the legal agreements and framework is set up is they will still act as custodians for their client. Um, we simply need to do settlement, um, you know, when we're doing that matching, which is the only reason. The record keeping is done live right on Corda, right on the, right on the chain. Awesome. That's all the uh, questions and, and time for today. So thank you very, very much to uh, Brian and Kevin from Total Bank Solutions. Um, another fantastic solution being Thank brought. Thank you for having us.